All right, I've preached elements of this sermon before, but it might be a good reminder for you if you uh, don't remember when I preached it last. It was over a year ago. Uh, the title of the sermon this morning is Biblical Principles on Money. Biblical Principles on Money. And um, I know sometimes people don't like talking about money, they don't like preaching about money, but money is a very practical thing in our life. It affects all of us. So I think it's important that we understand uh, biblical teachings about money so we don't get the wrong idea about money and obviously have the right perception of money as well because i think there's a lot of uh wrong teachings out there on money and i'll go through them today verses are misunderstood situations are used to promote a certain idea of money in the bible um, and i want to sort of undo some of those today and and talk a bit about the problems with wrong teaching on this topic now we read through 1 Timothy 6 because I wanted to focus particularly uh, on this passage here. But first of all, the point I want to make is I've got three major points I want to talk about today. They're quite long points. So hopefully this sermon is interesting for you. But the first point is, is that money isn't evil. You know, it's like some people are taught that like sex is evil, for example, just inherently evil, as opposed to, you know, within marriage it's good and outside of marriage it's wrong. Some people are taught that just money is evil, you know, as opposed to just, just the money itself and it's sinful and everything. And they're misunderstanding 1 Timothy 6, whereas it's not money that's evil. <clears throat> Let's read through here, 1 Timothy 6. But godliness with contentment, and this is why we read 1 Timothy 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Now, one thing people misunderstand about contentment is that contentment, they just think of contentment like laziness. They just think, well, I'm content where somebody's just, oh, you know, I'm just, you know, I don't need to strive for anything more. You know, I just need to be like, uh, like what's, what's the word? You're just like standard, like status quo, and you're just fine being, like not excelling or not doing any better at work, doing better in business, bettering yourself, improving your skills. And they think, well, it's just because I'm content. Now, that's just laziness, right? Laziness is when you're not trying to excel and improve yourself. What does it mean to be content? Content means that you're happy, right? So when it says godliness with contentment is great gain, it means that you're godly and you're happy. So what's the proof of whether you're happy is what's when we brought nothing into this world it is certain we can carry nothing out so whether you have or you have not are you still happy right so content doesn't mean that you're just you just should just stay where you are and not excel for anything more content means that you are have joy no matter what situation you're in you know if you're doing well you're joyful if you're striving and you're not doing well you're still joyful, but it doesn't mean you're not striving to do better, right? So some people misunderstand, because I've, I've heard this taught my whole life like that, you know, when I was at church, it's like, you know, because the first church I went to was like that. You know, they sort of discourage people working hard, excelling at work, starting a business. My brother experienced this same thing, you know, because he owns his own business. And this is one of the problems with, you know, the wrong sort of teaching from the Bible where Christians aren't taught, hey, you, you should strive to do well, you should strive to do better and then you know then they wonder why like you know churches struggle for money they churches struggle for this and they struggle for that they have a drive to do something and nobody has what's well, because you've taught your whole life christians not to strive for anything you know just to do like the bare minimum job you know and you wonder why like there's, there's no there's no money to be used right so i think there are detriments to that sort of teaching godliness with contentment is great gain for we brought nothing into this world is certain we can carry nothing out Having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. So as long as you have food and clothing, you should be happy, right? But they that will be rich. So see, this is not saying that those that just are rich, right? Because when you read that in today's English, you just say, well, those that will be rich, are thinking, well, those that are going to be rich, you know, because we use that terminology that way. No, this is saying those that desire to be rich. That's what they're after, is just the, as a goal in and of itself, to be rich but they that will be rich. So you see how it's not just a sin to be rich, but if it's the, sin, the sin is when people, that's their end goal, right? That's what they live for. And that's why it talks about here the love of money. They that will be rich fall in temptation and a snare into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in perdition and destruction and perdition. Look at this. For the love of money is the root of all evil which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith 
and pierce themselves through with many sorrows. So you see here, it's not money that's evil in and of itself, right? It's not evil to have money. It's not evil to make money. It's not evil to make more money than you're currently making, right? To strive and to do better because you can do good things with money. But what is wrong? It's the love of money. It's when you're doing it for the money itself, right? For the love of money is the root of all evil. So first of all, it's not money that's evil, it's the love of money. And it's not even that the love of money is, it's not even saying here the love of money is evil. What it's saying is the love of money is the root of all evil. So what it is, it is supporting, it's not the start of all evil, it basically sustains evil, right? Because when people want to do evil, the love of money sustains it. That's what it's talking about. Because some people get this idea that the love of money is like the, the start of all sin. That's how they understand the love of money is the root of all evil. But not every sin is because of the love of money, right? There are sins that are, that are done not because of the love of money. And some people sort of wrap, try and wrap their head around that. It's like, how can the Bible be teaching that the love of money is the reason why everyone sins? So that's not what the Bible's teaching. The Bible's not teaching that the reason for every sin that you do is the love of money. What it's saying is the love of money is the sustainer and what gives evil like strength and stability, if you think about what a root is for a tree. They've erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So when people start having the love of money and they are earning and chasing money for the sake of having money and material possessions, that's when you get into danger. But in and of itself, it is not wrong to <coughs> excel and pursue wealth in order to do things with it. So that's really the question, right? The, really, the question is, and we'll talk about that in a moment, is why are you making money? Why are you excelling? Why are you trying to improve? Because some people, they, when you make a business and you do better, you can actually help more people. There's a lot, a lot of reasons that you can, you, know, you can excel and have influence and provide, even provide other people with jobs. So you know, sometimes you know, when you are looking for a job and there's people in the church that own businesses and they give that person a job, so, I mean, that person had to strive, right? That person had to take risks and stay up late and work hard building that business. And aren't you grateful when that business owner can give somebody a job? But then if you start telling everybody, well, no, you shouldn't excel, shouldn't build a business, still shouldn't try and you know, improve that business, then where are all the Christian business owners? You know, where are all the Christian owners or Christian managers that are able to give somebody a break, help people out? So that's why there are some definitely some detriments to that sort of teaching. So it's not a sin to have money. It's not a sin to earn money. It's not a sin to earn more money than you are currently earning. Right? It's not a sin to strive to do more. Um, and like I said, this misdirected condemnation is, I think, due to incorrect teachings on these passages. And I think it's hindered a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of God's people from wanting to be business owners, to, from wanting to be entrepreneurs, from wanting to excel in their careers, excel in, you know, uh, be businessmen and investors. Now, aren't you happy? If you, if you know the CEO of Harvey Norman, you know, who knows Harvey Norman? I mean, everybody knows Harvey Norman, right? And you know the CEO of Harvey Norman, he, he, was, he took a lot of heat in the media because he didn't buy into this whole... Uh, gender gender quotas so if you know like what happens in corporations right now this whole gender equality and pay gap does. the pay gap if you look into it it's it's such it's such bogus because you know when you when they say that there's this women earn 70 cents of the dollar on men they don't take into account like women's choices what careers they take and all these other things there's all these factors and when they take into those factors into account women earn the same as men you know, and like even some women speak out. I remember listening to this one video on YouTube where uh, a woman uh, a programmer, right? Because in, in the tech industry, you know, they say, oh, it's dominated by men. That's why you got all this STEM steam and stuff to try to get women into to be developers and stuff. And this woman developer was saying like, you know, she earns just as much as her colleagues. And she was saying like, she was saying, 
in her when she watches her colleagues work. She's like saying, but the women, they don't want to work long hours. It's all the men that are working long hours, you know, when the office shuts down, all the women. So she's like saying, like, she says, women just don't want to make that choice because most of the men developers, they're happy to stay at work, you know, coding for a really long time, working long hours, very driven. But she just says, like, she just finds her women colleagues, they just don't do the same. So the pay gap is not just because men just don't want to pay women more. You know, it's because women make those sort of, and, and think about it, just from, even from a business's point of view, like when you, let's say you, you hired somebody to, to cut your lawn, for example, and you had a male and a female, but they, they both did exactly the same job. They could both do a, a, a purpose, exactly, everything the same. They did the same job, same quality, same time, but if the woman charged $70 and the man charged $100, who are you going to go with? Obviously, you'd go with the woman, right? Because the woman's cheaper. So in the workplace, if, if it was true that, that women can just get paid 70 cents on the dollar doing the exact same job, then, then only women would be hired. Because what business owner would want to hire men? They cost me, they cost me 30 cents more on the dollar. Right? But, so, but it's not the case. So it just shows that business owners aren't just paying women less, because if they could get the same amount of work and the same work done for, the, for a less price, they would, hire, they would hire women. So any company would do that. You know, so how, how did I get on to, to that? Wait, what was I talking about? Oh yeah, Harvey Norman, the gender thing. So Har Jerry Harvey, who was the ex-CEO, he started obviously Harvey Norman. They have these gender quotas. So because of this whole pay gap myth, right? Now it's like, well, you have, they're forcing companies to just, you know, they just look at the raw numbers. It doesn't, doesn't matter like what, what career women are choosing and why they choose what careers, who's willing to put in more time and everything. They just look at the numbers in a company and just, or at the executive level and just say, you've got 10 executives, seven of them are men, three of them are women. Oh, there's gender inequality. You know, never mind when you look in some departments in a company, it's all women. You know, like in the company I work for, you look in the marketing department, the art department, it's all women, right? I've been in meetings where it's literally all women, right? When you're dealing with marketing, with HR, our comms team is all women as well. So you just see, you just see this hypocrisy within the departments. But at the executive level, that's where they want equality, right? Because that's, that's what's public. So anyway, Jerry Harvey just like said, I was blown, right? This whole you know, gender, quotas, and things like that. But aren't you, my point is, aren't you glad when a CEO of a huge company takes a right stand on something? Yeah. Aren't you glad when a company like in America, like Chick-fil-A, doesn't give in to the rainbow crowd, the same sex marriage? Aren't you, aren't you glad when they say no? Like, we're not going to give in to this political correctness, left-wing agenda, the homosexual agenda. Well, you know what? If you teach Christians that they can't excel, they can't make money, they can't build businesses, they can't be entrepreneurs, you're never going to get those people. Why? Because you're telling all those people that they, they are, you know, they're being worldly, they're chasing this and chasing that. Hey, not everybody needs to be full-time in the ministry. Not everyone's cut out for it. Not everyone's a preacher. Not everyone has the desire. Just because they have potential, you need a desire to do this, right? You don't just like, get anyone and everyone into it. You know, people just, you know, they have capabilities and they get into something that they don't even want to do. Some people God has to build businesses. Some people God has to do different things, right? And you can use those talents to serve God, yes. But you know what? You can use your ability, you know, if some people have the financial ability to make a lot of money and that's one of their talents and they hey they can use that to serve the lord too not everybody you know we all have a different part to play in the body now look at this this is proverbs 13 it says a good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children and the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just so what is this talking about so the first part is saying well a good man actually is left with some wealth Right, so what is it saying is that, you know, you have, first of all, it can't be wrong to have wealth if a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. So there, there must be something there to give to his children's children. But it also shows that a good man doesn't squander his wealth. 
Why? Well, you just like blow it all on something. There's actually some savings there. There's something to pass down as a righteous person. Now, are there times when there's like persecution and there's times where Christians aren't able to, you know, get into the economy and it's hard for them? Yeah, there is. But where there's freedom to be able to do that, yeah, and Christians can use that and, 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 and participate in the economy. And a righteous person should be doing these things. A righteous church person should be working on being a productive member of society. Because that's ultimately what money is, right? Money is a conversion of your production in a society. So you produce things, you know, right? and you produce either through your labor and through way, and, and you can convert it into money. So money is a measure of how productive you are in a society. So somebody making more money, that just shows they're more productive than you are, right? And then what they do with that money is a different thing. And what does this say? And the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. Why is that? Because ultimately we're going to inherit all things. Right? We're going to, those of us who are saved, inherit the earth, inherit things. So all that, what it's saying is here is those people who are, are not saved, they build up all this wealth, they build up everything here, and then we're going to rule and reign over it for a thousand years. Right? So that's what that's talking about. Now let's just quickly address some objections. So that's some of the problems with the wrong teaching of money, right? <clears throat> but let's, let's look at some objections. One is they'll say, well, Jesus was poor, right? And Jesus will say things like this when he... And remember, when we're reading through Jesus' life, we're reading through the three years where he had his ministry, right? It says here, Jesus saith unto him, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Now, this doesn't mean that Jesus didn't have somewhere to lay his head up until he started this ministry, right? Because he lived with his parents. He had, he had somewhere to live. So we don't know what Jesus was doing up until he started his ministry. We know that his father was a carpenter. So his, car his father had some sort of trade, had some sort of business. If you think about it today, somebody's a carpenter, somebody's an electrician. I mean, that's somebody that's working. You know, he's had somewhere to live. So his parents obviously had a place. They might not have been like rich, rich, rich. You know, he wasn't born with a silver spoon in his mouth. But we don't know, we're not saying he didn't have nothing. You know, he didn't have this idea that you just should be living off the clothes on your back and it's just like, you know, give away all your things to the poor and everything like that. And I'll talk about that in a moment. But this is a person on a, on a mission, on a ministry, right? So he, he starts his ministry, he's traveling now. So those that preach the gospel should live off the gospel. So this idea that, you know, you just be like a nomad like Jesus, this is not... I don't think this is what the Bible is teaching, right? In terms of these three years, this is a special ministry that he's going through and he's teaching us many things as he goes on this ministry. Ultimately, it, the climax is his death, burial and, and resurrection. So we don't know what he did up until he was 30 years old. I mean, do you think Jesus didn't work at all? And he didn't help his dad with his business he, or he didn't do something? I mean, surely he was doing something to earn money up until he was 30 years old, knowing that his dad was a carpenter. Also, Jesus didn't have any wife or children, right? So if you live this sort of life and you have wives and children, then you, you need to make sure that they're provided for. That's why like, if they live this sort of life, they need to live of the gospel. So they are provided for. They still have an income coming in to take care of themselves, even the apostles and whatnot. And we see even when Jesus died, he made sure his mother was taken care of. So there, there's this idea that you need to make sure your family is taken care of. But... That's not, a re that's not a reason to say that you shouldn't make any money at all, you know, don't worry about excelling and other things like that because this is not the only example we are given in the Bible. And like I said, we don't know what Jesus did up until he was 30. Only we know like once his ministry started, now he was on a mis mission and a ministry to preach the gospel and to move. So, you know, this is like, a, like somebody who's a full-time missionary, right? And he's being provided for. And that was a hard life back then. That's why when he, he's saying, hey, if you want to follow him, and back then, like physically, you had to actually physically leave things behind and actually travel with him. Okay, let's continue. Like some people will say, like, well, the disciples were poor, as if they had nothing. Again, when they're traveling, it's a bit different, right? When they're traveling and they're being missionaries. But even the disciples, they didn't have nothing. When you look through the Bible, I mean, you know, you had Adonis and Sapphira selling a parcel of land, but not only that, like these disciples, they had houses. Like, I don't even own a house. Right? So, I don't own a house. These guys own houses. You could say, like, these guys are more well off than I am. I'm like paying rent right, every week. These guys own houses. Look at like, look, look what it says here in Mark 1. 
And forthwith, when they were come out of the synagogue, they entered into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. So these guys have a house. Not only that, you say, well, like, what about Philip the Evangelist? Remember Philip traveling around, baptizing an Ethiopian eunuch? Man, he must just be living like you know, with a sack on his back and everything like that. And just like, no, that's just when he was traveling on a mission. But look, this is in Acts 21, where he's now at home, settled in with his family. And the next day, we were of Paul's company, departed, came unto Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip the evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. So Philip not only had a house, right? so he wasn't just like had nothing, right? It wasn't just like, okay, just sell your house, give to the poor, right? He had at least provided for himself, provided for his four daughters, which were living with him. But also that, his house was big enough, I mean, I'm not saying it has to be a mansion, but his house was at least large enough to have Paul and the people traveling with Paul stay with him. So you see how he's not just like this really, you know, because people just think like these apostles had nothing. No, like they, they do have some things. Like they lived places. And even the disciples, when it was the church in somebody's house, whose house are they living? They're living obviously in somebody's house. Like they're meeting in somebody's house. Here's Aquila and Priscilla. It says, After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy, with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome, and came unto them, and because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. So Aquila and Priscilla are one of the more famous disciples in the, new, in the early church. And here Paul is staying with them. So they have somewhere to live, right? So there's some, they have a house that they, that they own, or they at least can pay for, right? But not only that, they have a business. Because when Paul went to stay with them, Paul also was a tent maker. He says, well, by their occupation, they were tent So Paul was able to work with them. So you see how this is this idea, like, and we see this in churches today, like where somebody might have a business and it's like somebody might come and they can just give them some work, you know, maybe own a cafe and it's like, oh, hey, we can do some serving. But if Christians never own businesses, how can you help somebody in that capacity? Right? So that's why it can be a blessing when there are God's people have an entrepreneurial spirit, right? And they can build businesses, they can create wealth. Why? Because they can help people with that wealth. Let's look at one more objection before we get on to another point. Is the rich young ruler. So this is probably the most famous one where people will say, oh, as a Christian, you should just sell all you have and give to, you, to the poor. And I've misunderstood this one before, but I want to give you some thoughts on this one. So this is in Mark 10. We'll just read through it quickly. So this is when the, the rich young ruler comes to him, says he's kept all the commandments. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. Come, take up the cross, and follow me. And he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. Right, now we just leave it at that. You may wonder why, like Jesus is saying these things. But then we, we get some more insight into why these words were said to the rich young ruler. And Jesus looked round about and saith unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of heaven? So he says that, they're probably wondering, like, what? And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered, answereth again and saith unto them, Children, look at this, how hard is it for them that trust in, rich, in riches to enter in? The kingdom of God. So why is it hard for people that have wealth to enter into the kingdom of heaven? Because there's a tendency for people to have wealth to trust in that wealth rather than trusting in the Lord. And that's what was happening with, with the rich young ruler. And this is why he's teaching this thing here and why he said that to the rich young ruler. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, who then can be saved? Jesus looking upon them saith, for men, with men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. So the, see, the teaching here with the rich young ruler is not that wealth is evil and that he shouldn't have wealth. He was saying something to the rich young ruler to reveal to the rich young ruler that he was covetous, right? Because the rich young ruler was trying to justify himself by saying, I've kept the commandments. All these things have I done from my youth up, he said to Jesus. So Jesus said to him, well, sell all you have and give to the poor, and then you'll be perfect. 
and he went away sad because he had great possessions. And then the lesson here is, well, who then can be saved? Right? Because he's trying to be saved by his own good works, and then he's saying, well, with man it's impossible, with God all things are possible. And you know, this isn't the first time that Jesus... Well, first of all, when Jesus makes a statement to an individual, that doesn't mean it's a commandment to everybody, right? Because Jesus is saying something to an individual to reveal his heart, right? He's not stating a commandment for everybody. So it's different when there's a commandment in the Bible that applies to everybody as opposed to Jesus saying something specific to one person to reveal their heart. And this is not the first time that Jesus has done this. Think about even in Abraham's example. Remember when Abraham was told to sacrifice Isaac? Well, was he actually allowed to go through with it? No, he was stopped. So you, but you see how that commandment given to Abraham, that's not telling all of you, go and sacrifice your children on Mount Moriah, right? That's something told to Abraham to reveal Abraham's heart, you know, and we saw his faith, right? And his, then was his works made perfect because, or then was his faith made perfect in our eyes. So you see how God said to do something but didn't let him go through with it. Again, even with, um, you know, with the, uh, the woman caught in adultery, Jesus does this as well when he says something to reveal a heart. He says, hey, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. Is he actually telling people to stone this woman? No, because if they actually stoned her, they would have been taking the law into their own hands as opposed to bringing them to the authorities. But he's just saying things to reveal people's heart, to bring out their heart and to convict them. This is what's happening with the rich young ruler. He's not saying that Christians shouldn't have wealth or shouldn't strive for wealth. The question is, what was stopping this rich young ruler from getting to heaven? Well, first of all, he was trusting in his riches and Jesus said that to him to reveal that's what he was trusting. Now let's get into the second point. So those are just some of the objections. Hopefully some get you to, to think about these things, some of the misconceptions with teaching that it's just rot having money and striving for money is evil in and of itself. And I sort of alluded to this in the first section, but some questions about money. Some questions about money is the second section. Is, first of all, how are you making the money? Because there is a right way to make money and there is a wrong way to make money. You can make money through, you know, through integrity and honest practices and you can make money through dishonest practices and you can cheat people and fraud and you can do things that are illegal and you can do things that are wrong. So just making money, any, what, what can make it wrong is how you make the money. If you make it dishonestly, if you make it doing sin, then that can be wrong. Look at Proverbs 1. My sin, if sin is enticed thee, my, my son, if sin is enticed thee, consent thou not. If they say, <clears throat> come with us, let us lay wait for blood, let us look privily for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave as ho and whole as those that go down into the pit. We shall find all precious substance, we shall fill our houses with spoil. So this is like evil people, you see. And they're saying like, hey, let's, let's start a business together. You know, let's, let's, let's get together, we'll find all, we're going to make a lot of money. Right? You, you yoke up with evil people, start a business, people with dishonest practices. Hey, we shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Right? We have big, nice, big houses with nice things in it. Cast in thy lot among us. Let us all have one purse. What is that talking about? It's like investing together, right? Investing, putting all your money into something that's dishonest with evil people. So you've got to be careful who you do business with as well. My son, walk not thou in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path, for their feet run to evil and make haste to shed blood. Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird. Right? So saying you're working in vain to catch, you know, things, right? Catch, to, 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 do, to, to catch like your prize. And they lay wait for their own blood. They lurk privily for their own lives. So sometimes people are willing to make money through innocent blood as well. Think about the abortion industry. Think about you know people selling um, you know uh, oil and stuff. You know people do all sorts of things. How they war and they oppress people to make money. So are the ways of everyone that is greedy of gain, which taketh away the life of the owners thereof. So you can make money the right way. You can make money the wrong way. So there's a right way to make money and there's a wrong way to make money. Proverbs 13: Wealth gotten by vanity. So you remember here. Surely in vain the net is spread. So wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished. 
And even not in this lifetime, you know, so you may start a business and you start it wrong and that's not a business that's going to last. Even if it does, like the Bible says, the sinner, the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. So it's not going to be, you know, even in the next world. But he that gathereth by labor shall increase. So this is like honest labor where you're actually work, you're actually doing work, doing right, and you increase. Right? So how are you accumulating wealth? That's one question. Right? So it's not just having wealth. How are you accumulating that money? Are you doing it through sin? You know, some, co some companies have to murder, like abortion. You know, fornication, obviously you have a business where you're like selling your body, or you're like a pimp selling bodies of other ladies and things like that. That's a wrong way to make money. Or through corruption or oppression. You know, maybe you paid off a politician to help your business. Right, that happens all the time, right? Pay them off so you can, you know, they let that slide, they let rat regulation slide, or they, they pass a law that helps your business and helps, you know, other businesses now can't enter the market. That's why you gotta really be careful when big businesses like Facebook and all that start pushing for regulations. Any big business that starts pushing for regulations, you just gotta be careful. Because they're not, you think they, you think these big businesses care about you, you know, it's just marketing. They just, they just know that they want you, that you want them to care about them. So they do it because the people think that they do care. They, they, they're out to make money, right? And when they start passing regulations and making it hard, businesses have to do this and do this, do this for safety and security. Oftentimes they do it. It's so, the, they're trying to get the competitors out of the market. See, because when you're a big business making millions and millions of dollars, and you have to abide by these tax regulations and government regulations and safety regulations, you can pay for all that. But then when you're a, a small business trying to compete with that big business, you, you think now you've got to abide by all these regulations and, and taxation and all this stuff that's been put in by these businesses that are already successful. So if you wonder why there isn't like, a, like this really hard to compete with Google and Facebook. It's really hard to compete with Woolworths and Coles. It's really hard to compete with all these different industries. Well, it's because they pass all these laws and all these regulations that make it so hard for somebody else to compete with them. Because now the barrier to entry, because now it might have cost you this much to start a business in that industry to compete with them. And now they pass all this taxation regulation and you know, safety regulations and all these checks and everything. Now it costs you this much to even get into the industry to, to compete with them. And you'll see that. If those of you who have started a business, you'll know what I'm talking about. But, you know, most people are just employees. Most people just work for a business and that's why they don't, they don't understand these things from a business person's point of view. But a business has to think about these things to even give you a job. Right? Businesses have to think about these things to, in order to employ you. If a business doesn't make money, then, the, then you don't have a job. Right? So the, the fact that the business, somebody is out there trying to make money, trying to improve, that's what even provides jobs for other people. Or it might be through theft. You know, theft is a bad way to make money. Um, and inflation. Inflation is the way the banks steal from you. Right? So inflation is when they print money. You know, we just have this idea today that just money just keeps decreasing in value. And you just think like, yeah, inflation 3% every year. Do you know that that's not, that's not normal? You know, because when, when gold and silver was money, I mean, that's what things are worth. They're just worth in gold and silver and things, the things don't really change, right? Because you can't just create gold out of nothing. You can't just create silver out of nothing. But the reason why prices just keep going up and value of money just keeps going down is because they just, the printing press at the Reserve Bank of Australia it just keeps going and going and going, printing more and more money. And when you print money, whoever gets to spend it first is actually stealing from the rest of us. Right? Because you have money, it decreases in value. Why did it decrease in value? Because somebody printed money and then spent it first. So inflation is actually how the banks steal from a population, right? And then they lend money to the, they lend money that they've printed out of thin air to the government, and the government then pays interest on that money that they've borrowed from the reserve bank to just printed it and just numbers in a computer out of nothing. And who's going to pay all that interest? The taxpayers. You see how it's like the banking industry is like so dishonest, how they make money. And, and these cryptocurrencies as well. You gotta be careful of these cryptocurrencies. I'm really against cryptocurrencies. I think it's like a really bad idea. But you know, if you can make some money off a, off a bubble, you know, all, all the best to you. I, I, I don't think it's wise investing in bubbles and investing in these hypes. But just be careful of some cryptocurrencies 
because cryptocurrencies are the exact same. You know, just making something out of nothing, just numbers in a computer, and then you're spending buying it. Eventually, you know, th th that wealth is going to go, right? When that technology gets replaced, and we can already see Bitcoin getting replaced by other technologies. So, you know, just be careful. It's not like gold and silver. Don't don't believe that. I'm I'm not convinced at all that cryptocurrencies are like gold and silver. Now I'm getting way off time. I'm, I'm so not going to finish. I'm not going to finish this sermon, but I'll try. Uh, hopefully, it's interesting for you guys. So, labor and vanity. So, money isn't wrong in and of itself. The question is, why do you even want to make money to begin with? Do you remember the love of money is the root of all evil? So it's wrong to have a love for money in and of itself, but it's not wrong to make money, to have money, to earn more than you have. The question is, why do you want to make it? What are you using that money for? That's really what it comes down to. And we see here in Luke 12, the rich young ruler, or the rich, the rich fool, in Luke 12, verse 16, he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, there was much goods laid up for many years. Look at this. Take thine ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. So why was the rich fool trying to make a lot of money? Because he could take it easy, just live in pleasure. Right? That's a wrong reason, wrong way to use your money. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So the Bible saying if you are just making money, just to live an easy life, a life of pleasure. I want to give my children the life I never had. That's the wrong reason to make money. So you see, it's not wrong to make money. The question is, why are you striving to make that money? If the reason why you're just making the money is just to serve yourself, that's what's wrong, right? And, uh, you know, that's why the Bible says you don't labor to be rich just to, just to, do, just to serve yourself. Look, labor not to be rich. So you're not just laboring just to be rich in and of itself like i just want to be rich some people are like that i mean when you look on youtube and you're looking at like people are teaching you how ways to make money you got to be careful of that philosophy because that philosophy is out there that people just want to make money just to be rich just for the sake of being rich bragging rights they say flexing your muscles telling people how much you have that's what the bible's warning against but if people make money and use it that's Use it for good, that's a good thing. Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? You see, you don't want to hold your riches too tightly, but riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven. So knowing that, hey, even if you have riches, it's not, it's not forever. You know, the wealth that you create in this world, where are you going to put it? Well, look at what Jesus says. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So you see how you don't lay up treasures upon earth. So, so somebody who's laboring just to be rich, they're just laboring just to lay it up on earth. But if you're laboring to create wealth, to lay it up in heaven, well, you can, you know, you can transfer that into heaven by using that on the things of God. Using that to help people, using that for the things of God and helping the work of God. So, like you can see, it's not just having money, right? It's how you use it. 1 Timothy 6, remember we started there where it said the love of money is the root of all evil, remember? And you're thinking, well, surely it's just condemning people that are rich. Well then, why then at the end of the chapter does it give instructions to people that have wealth, right? Charge them that are rich in this world so what, are they, what is the problem with being rich? That they be not high-minded, right? That they get proud, nor trust in uncertain riches. Doesn't that sound familiar? Doesn't that sound familiar with how highly should they that trust in riches enter into the kingdom of God? And look at this. But in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. That they do good. That they be rich in good works. So you see how the more they have, the more good works they can do, right? Ready to distribute. 
So you see the reason why you want to make a lot of wealth is so that you can give more, that you can do more for God with it, not just so you can live in pleasure and buy nice things for yourself and live in a huge house, you know, houses that are way too big for you, cars that are way too expensive, go on extravagant holidays. If that's the reason why you're making wealth, that's what's sin. But if you're making wealth in order to be a blessing, you know, that's a good thing. Willing to communicate. Laying up. See, doesn't that sound familiar to what Jesus says? Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, but in heaven. That's what it says here. It uses the same terminology. Laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. So you see how you use your riches to invest in heaven? How? You're ready to distribute. Willing to communicate, right? You're willing to use those, those funds that you've created to help other people, help the cause of God. What about another reason why? So there's a difference between what, just wanting to be rich and wanting to be more productive to help more people. Because, you know, the less time you're working for money, the more time you have to, to do other things, right? Like if you're constantly just training all your life at a job, I mean, you know, what, what more can you do in other areas? Like you can never do something on the side when you're just taken away from that job. Imagine if you had to, to just work like more than eight hours a day. You had to work like 12 hours a day just to make ends meet, right? All that time is, where's the time for soul winning? Where's the time for church? Where's the time to be a blessing to somebody else? Where's the time to get involved politically? Where's the time to get involved with this, with that, with that charity? Where's all that time? So, you know, for us, that's why we shouldn't just be mediocre. That's the word I'm looking for. You know, when people are just, they're content. They just think it's just being, living in mediocrity. Because you want to get out of just trading your whole life for a paycheck. Because if you can become more productive, you know what? If you can just spend 12 hours a week working, well, now you've got more time to do things for God. So you see, but if Christians are just told, no, oh, just, just, just stay in that job where you're working 12 hours a week and earning minimum wage, you see how that's actually being less productive for God? Because if you teach that person how to fish, right, and how to make more money, how to be more productive, then that, now you have a servant with somebody with the right heart can then do more for God. You know, they have more money to help the things of God and also have more time as well for themselves to, in order to do things for God. Now, why am I at Proverbs 20? Because another reason why you don't just want to be, you know, poor is because they have no money at all and not even think about the future is because there's going to be a time when you're not going to be able to work anymore. You know, so you have to think about that as well. You have to be a responsible Christian and think, hey, I can't just blow all my money and just think, oh, I'm just giving, you're giving it all to me, giving it all to God and whatever, because there's going to be a day where you're not earning money anymore and you need to be able to provide for yourself, maybe provide for your wife, but still be able to provide a, a, a living for yourself. And if you haven't put anything away for retirement, and I'm not talking about retirement where people just, you know, they can still work, but they just like stop working and they just become lazy, right? I'm talking about retirement where like you now maybe you can't physically work anymore. Or, like you couldn't, you couldn't earn a living wage, but then you put some money away to be able to live off. Look at Proverbs 20. The sluggard will not plow by reason of the cold. Therefore shall he beg in harvest and have nothing. So how many people are in their later years and they, they need a handout. They need people to take care of them. When they didn't just, you know, when they were younger and they were productive, thinking about the future, thinking about, hey, I'm in summer now, I'm in the harvest, but one day winter's coming, right? One day something's going to happen, I'm going to have to have some stored away. And here it's saying, hey, the slug, it always has a reason not to work, right? And then when it comes time, he's going to have to beg because he's got nothing. <clears throat> when it's time to actually reap that harvest, right? Because he's not sowing in the off season. So why are you accumulating work, work, wealth? There's good reasons and there's bad reasons. And really that, at the end of the day, comes down to what is the problem with money? It's how you are using it. And also priority. Are you neglecting your priorities or your duty as a Christian or as a, uh, as a, as a husband, you know, or as a, as a, as a parent, in the pursuit of wealth. Look at Luke 8. We talked about this already, about the thorns. And that which fell among thorns are they, which they, when they've heard, go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. 
So you see, you can use your money just to have pleasures of this life. What is the priority in your life? You still need to make sure, like Jesus says in Matthew 6, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So how you're accumulating your wealth, why are you accumulating your wealth, and what priority does accumulating wealth have in your life? If, if you're so stuck on accumulating wealth that you're not in church, you know, you're always working on Sundays, you don't have time to get involved in any ministries, you don't have time to get involved in it, because you're, you're always working, always got to do this, then your priorities are wrong. You need to find a way to balance those priorities. So God is always first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And that's why I think it's a noble thing of like, say, a company like Chick-fil-A. They don't open on Sundays. Now, I think that's interesting. I don't think it's a sin to work on Sundays in and of itself, but I think it's interesting that a business, is, a business, a Christian business has decided, you know what, we don't even want people that should be at church working in our business. And, you know, they, they're doing really well. So isn't it great? They're a great example that the CEO is like saying no to same-sex marriage. They're saying, hey, we're not even going to open on Sundays. Why? Because you should be at church on Sundays. Um, you know, that's, a, that's, a quite, that's quite a cool thing for a business to do. Uh, now let's, go in, let's get into the last one. That should be at number three. I probably forgot to <laughs> change the number on the slide. This is number three, but let's just talk a bit about practical ways people can make money. Um, so just talking about philosophically, I mean, you may have seen some of this bad thing before. You might have seen this graph before. Uh, it was made popular by Robert Kiyosaki and Rich Dad, Poor Dad. But I just think it's, this, is very, this is good wisdom, though. This is very, it's very interesting that you understand this because what this graph talks about is the different ways people make money in the world and what you should be striving for to be more productive. So there's this sort of grid of how people make money. And the first one is you can make money as an employee, right? So that's what the E represents. And this just means you have a job. So this is where everybody starts. Everybody starts with just working for somebody else, right? Because that's how you can make more. It's very hard to start a business from nothing. Some people do. But most people, they start as an employee, and this is where you, you have a salary. You say, I'm going to give you 40 hours of my week, and you're going to pay me 50,000, 70,000, 80,000, whatever. That's where you start. And you never become more productive than that, because it doesn't matter how productive you are at work, you still get paid the same. Right? You still get paid that same salary. It's not like you can get paid more based on how much, you, how much you do, because you're paid for your time, not for your productivity. Unless you have like a sales job, right? like a commission or something. Now, S stands for self-employed. So one step up from employed is you can be self-employed, which is basically you own the job. So rather than you have a job from somebody else, but you don't own the actual position, a self-employed person owns the position. And this is where the harder you work, for those of you who are self-employed, you might think of a trade, like an electrician or a plumber or something. Those are people who are self-employed. The more they work, the more they earn. So this is like, it is based on your productivity. So if you can be very productive, some people who are self-employed, they might work like four days a week and they can make enough to, to, for the whole week. So they can take one day off and they have a bit more time. They can do other things, be more involved in church and whatnot. So that's self-employed. A little bit harder to get started, but it's another way you can make money. Another way you can make money is B, is that you're a business owner. Now a business owner, what they do is they own a system. So what they do is they have a system and they can plug people into that system and they can leverage off the labor of other people. So you might have a business where you hire independent contractors or you may have a business where you just hire employees that work for you. So a business owner has the system and the structure and he plugs these people. So he's the one, he's the one that these people are sometimes working for, right? The business owner. And because he has that leverage where he set up that system, he's done the investment, you know, he set it up, now he can take, take a step back a bit and make some money. He's got more time, right? Because he's set up that system. He's allowed this person to make money to get a start, but it took a lot of risk for him to be able to be in that position. So sometimes when you see business owners and you just think, oh man, they just walk in, they just got it easy. You know, you're like, maybe work, I used to work at a restaurant. I used to have that mentality, right? Like the owner just comes in, just sit down, he can have a coffee, he's just chatting. Yeah, when, 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 when service is over, you go home. And they're like, you know, dealing with the accounts, dealing with everything, dealing with the problem, fixing equipment. doing all, You don't see all that stuff, right? all that stuff that goes on. And when you run a business, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And that's why for this person to earn more money, when you're a business owner, you go, damn well right, you should make more money. 
because he's taking more risk, he's doing more work, all of it falls on him. Why should this person make as much as this person when this guy is the one that even got this guy the job? It's because of this guy's work that this guy is even able to, to even be employed. Because if there was none of these, guess what? There'd be none of these. Yeah. Right? So, yeah, they make more money. And if you, know, if you can get to that point, then you obviously can be a lot more productive. And this is where, like, I guess the ultimate is where you don't just own a system and you're still kind of working. This is where I stands for an investor. An investor is now you have money, now you can use that money to make more money. Right? So you have to kind of go through these, in a sense, to get to this. But anybody can start here, but, but the idea is you're striving to get towards this side of the graph. Because on this side of the graph, you have like more time, you're more productive, you actually have money working for you. Now you can do more things for God, as opposed to trading all your time just to work for this guy. Right? So this is where like now money works for you. So if you think about things like stocks, property, investments, you know, even having money in an interest-bearing account in, in the bank, which I don't think is, I, I personally don't think that's the best way to do it because it's a low interest rate. But if you think about that, see, and this is why people that have enough wealth, this is the whole idea of retirement, right? If you have enough wealth, put away in an investment account, the money that that, what, what you're actually doing here as an investor is you are funding this. Right? So a business owner, when, you know when a business owner has to go take out a loan and think like, okay, I've got this idea, I'm going to implement it, I'm going to take out money. Well, he's getting money from these people. So when you buy like stocks and shares, or even if you invest privately, you know, you may help somebody start a business by providing the money. You've got to have that money first, right? So you have that money, you invest it, this person pays them a return, this person is able to then build a business to provide income for these guys. So this is how like sort of the economy works. But the idea is you want to get to this because this is where if you can have money work for you and make money and get to that point, then that way you have a lot more time and a lot more productivity, a lot more blessing you can be to other people. So this is the idea. The idea in life is this is this false idea of just, just be content. And, just, and that means just be mediocre, right? Because you know, love of money is evil. You, know, you shouldn't be making any more money. But the idea is, no, you want to be more productive so you can be more of a blessing, also have more time. So this is where you start when you're younger, right? And you're employed, but you want to sort of start working your way this way, right? So that as you get older, you don't have to keep, because one day you're not going to be able to work anymore, right? So that's why people start working towards this. Now you might think here, how money works is you, you earn interest. Right, on your investments. That's how it works. Right? You put money in the bank, you get interest. Right? You put money into an investment fund, stocks and bonds, you get interest and dividends. Uh, or property, the interest of property is, is like their rental payments. Right? So if you own a property, you get rental payments, that's your return on your investment. But somebody might say, but what I, I thought usury was a sin in the Bible. Isn't usury a sin in the Bible? So I want to just explain this concept because this is another wrong conception people have in the Bible is that having either earning interest or charging interest is a sin, right? And in the Bible, it's called usury. So let's just look at a few passages really quickly. And I think as we read through Exodus 20, you'll know what the Bible's talking about when it's talking about usury and, the, and where it's from. Exodus 22, If thou lend money to any of my people that is poor by thee, thou shalt not be to him as a usurer, neither shalt thou lay upon him usury, if thou at all take thy neighbor's raiment to pledge, thou shalt deliver it unto him by, the, by that the sun goeth down. For that is his covering only, it is his raiment for his skin. Wherein shall he sleep? And it shall come to pass, when he crieth unto me, that I will hear, for I am gracious. Leviticus 25. And if thy brother be waxen poor, and fallen in decay with thee, then thou shalt relieve him. Yea, that, though he be a stranger or a sojourner, that he may live with thee, take thou no usury of him or increase, but fear thy God, that thy brother may live with thee. Thou shalt not give him thy money upon usury, nor lend him thy victuals for increase. <clears throat> so this idea of usury, this is another one of those things where people just, they, they learn something like, oh, usury is bad. The Bible condemns usury. And they're not really thinking about what this passage is actually teaching. And with the wrong idea of usury, People like get this idea that like Christian banks, you know, if you're a Christian bank, you shouldn't be in the banking industry. 
you know, you shouldn't be in investments. You know, if, you know, pe pe we need to set up like these interest-free credit cards, like the Muslims have, right? Like interest-free credit cards, because like usury is a sin and all that sort of stuff. No, that's not what this is teaching, right? And as you read, we read through Exodus 22 and Leviticus, you can see, what is it teaching? What it's teaching is, if somebody is, is, is falling on hard times, or they're poor, and they need financial help, that's who you shouldn't be charging usury to. You know what I mean? Like if somebody's actually struggling, right, and then you lend them money, and then charge them interest, you're actually oppressing that person, because obviously they need the money, and then you give them money, and then you just expect to, to make money off them, that's what it's condemning. It's not condemning, you know, you putting the money in the bank and expecting a return. Like when you put money into the bank or you put money into an investment, don't you expect a return? Like if a friend came to you and said, I'm going to start this business, this great business idea, and I want people to invest, like I want you to invest like $20,000, $50,000, and you're thinking like, hmm, what if this is a good investment? And he goes, you know what? And, and the return on your investment is nothing, zero. Not gonna get anything. You know, why, why are you charging me usury? Why are you getting usury? You're gonna commit the sin of usury? You know, it reminds me of like a Seinfeld episode, right? Seinfeld is just like, it's about nothing. You know, it's, <laughs> this is an investment about nothing. Zip, nada. You'd be like, that's crazy. Right? Who's gonna do that? Well, who, it's like if you're a business owner and somebody and, and you're expecting money from the bank, you just think banks should just be like these usury interest-free loans. It could, it could get crazy. You wouldn't do it. Why would a bank do it? You know, because that money has value, right? Because if it's with you, that's why there's something called the time value of money. It's a, you give, you have money given to somebody else. Now you're not doing anything to make it money. So when you lend money to somebody else, you're expecting a return because you're saying, "Hey, well, I could have done something with this money. I'm giving it to you, so I expect something back, right? The cost of my my cost of not being able to make something with it." And the, the borrower is hoping, I'm going to make more than what he expects. So it's like, hey, I'm taking this money to invest in something that will make me more, and then I can pay back whatever the investor is uh, expecting. <laughs> so you see how this is not condemning just the practice of usury in general. What it's condemning is when you oppress the poor and the needy who need help and assistance and then you oppress them with usury, right? And then you lend money, and this is what a lot of the banks do do. Like when people are poor and out of luck, they give them like these credit cards that are like 17, 18, 20% interest. That's what it's condemning, right? Because there should be some charity there, some love there if people need help, where charities step in and maybe provide an interest-free loan for people that help it. But it's not talking about like a business owner or somebody, you as an investor, making money through usury, you're making money through interest. Look at this, Proverbs 28. He that by usury and unjust gain increaseth his substance. So people might go to a verse like this and say, well, see, the Bible's just condemning usury. No, but, it, but remember, Proverbs, and when you, when you read through like the prophets and Proverbs and whatnot, remember, it's the, whenever it's condemning something, it's always referring back to like the laws of Moses, right? The laws that were given in Deuteronomy and Exodus, Leviticus. So when it's condemning usury, well, what is it condemning? When you go to Leviticus and you go to... Uh, um, Exodus, we can see what's well, the oppression of the poor through usury. And we see here, he shall gather it for him that will pity the poor. So you see that connection there, it's saying, hey, you don't get it through unjust gain. He's like, God's going to help the person gather it for him that actually has some pity on those that are poor, right? So you can make money and help people that are less fortunate, less fortunate. And another thing why this idea of usury being a sin is so outrageous is because god is an investor do you see what i mean like god god in the parable of the talents and the pounds he's the master giving the pounds and the talents to his servants saying occupy till i come and when he comes back what does he expect a return on his investment so you see how it can't be wrong as a business owner to expect a return on your investment that's what god, god has invested in you Right? Not money, like, you know, obviously we have resources, but he's invested in you. You have pounds and talents, knowledge, abilities, resources. What's the return on investment you're going to give to God? Look at this. Wherefore then gave us not thou my money into the bank, that at my coming I might have required mine own with usury. So you see how God said the lazy servant didn't even put it in the bank. 
to get the free interest from lending that money to the bank. And that's what God, the master, was expecting when he came back to the servants. So you see how this idea of usury just being in complete sin does not line up with the Bible. So you want to work towards being that investor. This is, this is what you want to kind of work towards so that you can be more productive. Because you know what? Because if you can build wealth, let's, let's say you make like 100000 a year. Well, once you stop working, if you spend all that money and don't use it wisely, like don't invest, like even if like, you know, spending it on noble things, like noble causes, right? Let's say you spend all that money on noble causes and then you stop working. Now, now that money is like not producing anything. But if you're intelligent with your money and you invest, right? And now that money that you've made here is now just creating money and creating wealth. Well, you can just continue to give, right? So you can actually end up giving more and be more productive than just like blowing everything when you're an employee. So you need to be wise with your income. You know, some people are just like, you know, spiritually zealous, but spiritual zealousness it does not equal recklessness you know when you're reckless with your money and just like oh you know i've only got like ten thousand in the bank i'll just give it all to this cause i'll just give it all this no like you need to think about your family as well you need to think about these things and think about what's what's what can i you need to think about your whole life and think how can i be most productive with my life you know and 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 figure out like and be wise and, and obviously uh think about these things so you want to work work towards that and just this last couple of points i just want to share with you is and this was really uh mind-blowing for me is that you know we've talked about making money we talked about money's not a sin and stuff and i don't want you to get this idea that it's just oh right i just got to get out there and just like you know be like the next ceo and just like i gotta make millions i gotta have to six figure income and all this stuff you know because that's not what i'm saying all I'm saying is like, just, just consider have, having some wealth so you can be more of a blessing. Because, and this is one thing that blew my mind when you realize this is creating, having wealth is not just about like having the highest salary, right? And just like being paid the most, having six figure, seven figure salary or whatever. All it takes to create wealth is discipline and time. If you have discipline and you have enough time, you will have wealth. That's why I think, you know, when I realized this, then I realized, oh, that's why the Bible, I think, likens people who are righteous and just with people that have, will have riches eventually, have an inheritance to give to somebody else. You know, all things being equal, right? Obviously, if you're not being oppressed or things like that. Because it's not just living for money that gets you wealth when you're older. It's just having the discipline to save and enough time for it to accumulate. And let me show you, I just, and when I understood this, it just blew my mind. If, if you've never played around with a compound interest calculator, this is basically you know, a calculator where you can put in like how much you start at, how much you're gonna put in every week, or what the, what the uh, interest rate you may earn over that period, and the number of years, and you can see how that investment grows. So if you never played around with one, it's, it's, it's pretty crazy when you do. So let's just think of some, some figures that, are like, that anybody could achieve, right? So this one I've put at $300 a month. So $300 a month, if you think about it, that's about $10 a day, right? So $10 a day, if you think about what you spend in a day, if you could put aside 10 bucks a day, it's really not that much. Probably people will spend more on like eating out or like, you know, maybe you get two coffees, right? It's like $8, you buy a pack of cigarettes, right? It's like $40, isn't it? $10 a day, right, will equal around $300 a month. So after you look at these graphs, you'll notice it's not about how much you make, right? It's actually about how much you save. If you can be disciplined and just save, you will have enough money when, when you retire. Um, so $300 a month, where did I get the 7% from? 7% is just because I, 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 this is not investment advice, so don't sue me. But I use Vanguard, so Vanguard is like one of the bigger sort of fund investments. You can just invest in an index fund. So this is the one I'm invested in. And you can see like this is one of their funds and how it's performing. So this is the return over 10 years is at 9%. From the inception, it's about 7.22%. So I just figured, you know, standard like sort of investment fund should, should yield you about 7% interest. That's why I'm saying when you put it in the bank, it's not very wise because banks, 
nowadays give you like one or two percent, right? Three percent. Whereas if you put it into like some sort of investment fund, you can get seven percent uh, on average. So you put in seven percent, three hundred. We'll say like, okay, every month we put in three hundred. We're going to compound it annually. I don't know if it compounds monthly or annually, but I, I put the less just for the sake of this example. And I put 10 years, because why? I wanted to show you. Let's say you put away every day just 10 bucks, right? And you started at the age of 20. So you got this wisdom when you were young. I wish I had got this 10 years ago, right? Or 13 years ago. Just put $10 away every month into an investment account, right? Now, after 10 years, at 7% interest, $10 a day, you would have saved $36,000, right, just from the money you've put in. But your interest, so what you made on that after 10 years, is $13,739. So you would have about $50,000. Now that already, for some of you, may blow your mind and think like, well, man, I can't even imagine having that amount of money. I know like in, when I was 20, I couldn't imagine having that amount of money. But $10 a day for 10 years, you will have $50,000. Now let's say you did, let's say for some reason you just stopped at that. And you said, you know what? I'm not going to put any more money in the bank. Just put, put less or not, no more money into this investment account. I just now want to spend that $10 buying coffees and buying whatever else, drinks, eating out. And you did nothing for the next 35 years. Right? So usually, usually people retire at about 65. So you did nothing with that $50,000 for the next 35 years. So I changed these numbers over here. Oh, oh sorry. Change these numbers over here. So we're going to start at 49,739, right? We're going to put $0 in every month for 35 years at that 7% interest rate. Look how much you'll have when you're 65. You'll have 531,000. That's the sort of money like we, we didn't even fathom, right? When you're younger, you're just like half a million dollars. And that's if you did ten dollars a day for ten years and then did nothing, right? If you if you invest it wisely, right? You'll have half a million dollars. So you see how it's not about how much money you make. It's just about do you have the discipline to put a little bit away. Every week, every month, just invest it, you know, and just accumulate, accumulate slowly. $10 a day is what will get you there. Now let's say, let, let's, let's, let's say um, you started instead at the age of 30, right? So here we started at the age of 20, right? And we did $10 a day for 10 years. And then after 10 years, you just did nothing. You ended up with half a million dollars. Now let's say you started a bit later. You're like, okay, 30, I better get into this. I better start putting some money away. So you did the same. You did $10 a day and you did it for 35 years, right? Look at this. Just starting 10 years later at $10 a day, you actually have less. You have about $30,000 less than the 20 year old that did $10 a day for 10 years and then sat back and did nothing more. Spent the rest of their money on whatever they want. So isn't that amazing? Like, uh, that, that just blew my mind. It was like, ah, oh, so like that's, like, it, it's not even about how much money you make because that's what we think. We think, oh, if you want to have, have enough money to retire on, you know, have some money later on, it's about like just, you know, striving and just being like making the most you can. Now, no, no, if you're just disciplined in saving, you can make a huge difference when you retire. So let's say you go to, um, oh, I missed the last slide. I had one more slide, I must have missed it. Oh, here it is. I'm getting confused here. So this is the last slide. So this is if you did $300 a month. So let's say this is the last scenario, right? The last scenario is, let's say you're the 20 year old and you didn't stop, right, at 30 years old. So you, from 20, to 30, you put in ten dollars. You just put away ten dollars a day, and then from 30 to 65, you continued putting just ten dollars away. Now, this is not realistic because generally, when you're 20, you're making less money, right? And as you as you start to work more, you just will gain more skills. You'll naturally make more money, so you could put away more money. But let's say you just put away ten dollars a day for the 45-year period. 
Look at what you'd end up with, just at 7% interest, the average interest rate of, a, of an investment account. You'd be a millionaire. You'd have $1 million left to live from 65 onwards. So you see how it doesn't, like I said, it doesn't require you to just be this really, you know, ex, you know six-figure income CEO in order to retire with millions of dollars. What it takes is it just requires you to be disciplined in saving and then at this point, you could probably pay for a smaller house and be a blessing and all that sort of stuff. But chances are, if you are just your standard Australian, you'll probably be able to put more away than $10 a day. And then you'll probably have more than that. So, it's, so you see how it's not how much you earn. It's the time you have and it's how much you save. And this is why the Bible says here, look, the rich ruleth over the poor and the borrower is servant to the lender. Now, why is that? Because you see how this graph is exponentially growing as time goes on? Well, if you, if you borrow money, like if you spend money on credit cards, you have a lot of debt, you have student loans, you have credit card debt, this graph is actually working against you. It's actually going the other way. So here, if you're an investor, which is what the credit card company is, they're actually making money off you this way. At, you know, we've put this at 7%, so imagine when your credit card's like 13%, 15%, 20%, what this graph looks like. So that's why you've got to get rid of those debts, because when you have debt that has interest, this graph is going the other way for you, as opposed to this way. And that's why the rich rules over the poor. This is why it's a sin to, to, to lend poor people on usury, because ultimately you're just going to be ruling over them um, with a... Uh, with, with oppression, with, uh, with that interest rate. Now the last point I have is, so how can you get better at saving? Because there are, re there are different reasons why people don't save right, and invest. One is, maybe you're not living within your means. You know, you're spending more than you should. You know, people start working and then they, get a, they buy a house, they buy a car, they buy clothes that are too expensive, they start eating out, they start, oh, I got money now, now I can go and go on these holidays and go, they're not thinking about how they're going to put it away. So they, 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 they don't live modestly within their means. They buy larger houses or cars than they need to. You want to go and have a shopping spree. So what do you do? You go take out a credit card. And that credit card you don't pay off. Now you're paying 13 to 20% interest. You know, maybe you have unnecessary student loans. I know some people, they just like, want to just go back to school. For what reason? Like, just go back to school, get another degree, get another degree. I mean, these degrees cost money. Don't forget, you've got to pay back that hex. You know, like I had like a $20,000 debt I needed to pay off. And you just like get a degree, just to have another degree, pay another fifteen dollars to $20,000. Um, so unnecessary student loans. Uh, some people are just, you know, just lazy. Some people like they spend too much on like weddings, uh, you know, parties, engagement parties, you know, anniversary parties, big birthday parties. You know, they spend a lot of that. Uh, maybe a lot of gadgets or tech. Uh, what about women that spend too much on like clothing and makeup? You can, you can spend all that money on this stuff that is all vain. Uh, eating out, not buying in bulk, bad habits, drinking, smoking, scratchies. You know, maybe you have a bad habit every time you go to the servo, you get, get a pack of lollies. You know, four dollars a pack, five dollars a pack, and a drink. That's your ten bucks there that day. Uh, holidays, excess holidays when you're younger. You know, when you're younger and you're just making your money, you're starting to invest, why are you going on holidays there? Why don't you go on holidays when you put some away already? You already got some of that money working. You can go to holidays a bit later. Just the timing of it might not be right. Or what about excess hobbies? You know, spending too much time playing sport, too much time having this hobby or that hobby. Remember, there's always an opportunity cost to your time. So, you know, you know that, that, that time, you know, I know, you know, sometimes when you go to the futsal courts, you know, they have like, you know, there are like three or four competitions throughout the week and there's like these guys that are there like at every single competition, right? And it's like, you could be using one of those nights to do something, to build some money, work harder, figure out some side, some side hustles, you know, whatnot, you know, and or doing more for God even, you know, like having that time and thinking about, hey, what can I, I can do something on this night, you know, like rather than filling all your weeknights with sport, maybe what you're doing on Saturday or on Sunday, you can do on a weeknight, so then on Sunday you can come soul winning. On Saturday you can come to things. You can do things for God. Uh, you come to some of those rallies, you know, those rallies were on Saturday. So, 
How can you get better at saving? One thing is you can track where your money's going. You know, if you're somebody who's really bad at saving money, one thing I definitely recommend you do is you start tracking where that money's going, logging where that money's going. And you can do it on paper, you can do it on an Excel sheet, if you know Excel, or you can do an app. There's plenty of apps out there. I use an app called PocketSmith. It costs me like 100 US dollars a year, and it's linked into my bank accounts. So every time my bank has a transaction, it shows up in PocketSmith. It's the same stuff I use for church. So I can, I, can, I can categorize those transactions and that's how I can pull those reports up for you guys. I can see how much I'm spending in different categories. I can drill in, I can say, hey, how come I'm spending so much here? I can drill in, I can see those transactions. Because sometimes the banks don't keep transactions for many, many years. So you need to pull that data out if you want to analyze it. And if you're just getting the paper statements and you're like, oh, okay, I've got my paper statements. Yeah, but how are you analyzing that data in your paper statements? You've got to flick through like decades of paper statements to see like how much you spent on you know, holidays or something like that. Whereas if you track your money using a program, then you can know. Now the Bible actually has a principle in there that we ought to be tracking where our money goes. We shouldn't be ignorant of what we're doing with our money and where we are financially. Proverbs 27, be thou diligent to know the state of thy flocks. So you remember in Bible times, they had physical cattle. A lot of them were shepherds. So when it says know the state of your flocks, that's actually their income. They would sell the fur, sell the milk. They would kill the animals for you know, sacrifices and food and whatnot. So be thou diligent to know the state of thy flocks. Obviously, there's a spiritual aspect to it as well. And look well to thy herds. For riches are not forever, right? And doth the crown endure to every generation? So there's a reminder there that like, hey, one thing is you don't want to squander your money. But also, it's not, it's not forever as well. But you just need to be responsible with the money that you have. The hay appeareth, and the tender grass showeth itself, and herbs of the mountains are gathered. So you see, that is about maintaining their wealth, right? So you've got the flocks, and it's like, how do you maintain it? Well, you've, they're obviously, they're feeding the animals, the hay, and whatnot. The lambs are for thy clothing, and the goats are the price of the field. And thou shalt have goat's milk enough for thy food and for the food of thy household and for the maintenance of thy maiden. So you see, if you take care of where your money is going, then you can make sure you have enough to provide for yourself and provide for the people that are depending on you. But if you don't, if you just squander your money, you don't know where it's going. Um, so that's what I do. So I use an app pocket. So this is how I can get graphs like this. Right, so it's linked into the church bank accounts as well. I can, when those transactions are made, I can categorize them. I keep track of all those expenses so we can see. Oh, so when you wonder, like, hey, Victor, how do you know how, how the church is doing financially and where the money's all gone? Well, it's because I'm tracking that. So it's something that I did in my personal life that I brought into the way I run the church, right, in terms of the finances. So if you do this with your finances, you can see exactly where your money is going. And, and when you track, when, see, when you track your spending, what that does is, is it makes you aware of where that money's going. It's like if you want to lose weight. If you want to lose weight, the best thing you can do is you start logging what you're eating. Right? You log, oh, this is what I had for breakfast, this is what I had for lunch. It's like, oh, okay, I had that chocolate bar, I wrote the chocolate bar in, you know? And then you start to realize, like, oh, like, do I want to write that chocolate bar in? I better not have it. So it just makes you aware, like, you know, because you think, because you ask people that try to lose weight, they're like, oh, yeah, I don't, I don't eat that much sweets. It's like, well, then journal it. Then they're like, they don't want to journal it because you don't really, because you just think, you just have this thing, oh, yeah, I probably just every other day I get a coffee, every other day I have a drink, every other day. And then you journal it, you realize, oh, there's a chocolate bar here, chocolate bar here, like, just, all that money that's going into it. So it's the same with your money. Where you're like, just paying money, we have cash anymore, just paying. But then when you see it and you're tracking it, you're like, oh, that's where it's going. Like, man, I didn't realize. Like, sometimes I think, like, oh, man, how did I spend so much on toys? Like, you know, where's all this money? I can drill in. I think, oh, that's where it's going. So we got to kind of think, oh, okay, we're spending a bit too much in this area. So this allows me to do that sort of stuff. And you can see here, it breaks it down. You, have it, you can set your own categories. So if you want to track something, you say, okay, all this spend, I'm going to categorize as this. And I can see at the end of the year how much I'm putting there. You want to do that. Another thing you can do is you can set up regular payments. So that's one thing I do as well, is, you know, I get paid on a, on a Monday at my work. So on Monday, I have, you know, Monday is when I, I put money away for investments. Or back, I'm doing all right now, but back when I had bills and stuff like that, I have to make sure, like, hey, I have to put this money aside, put this money here into a different account. 
But that's what I do in terms of my investments. So now to make sure that I always am putting some money aside, I do that first to make sure something's always put aside. Right? You might do that as well with just like different causes that you're giving to, whether, whether it's the church or different causes, you put that aside into a different account. And you can, you can do that. If you do your net banking, you can automate these. So if I know I'm getting paid on the fortnight, on the Monday, then on the Tuesday, that money goes out. So when it's out of sight, it's out of mind. Right? So that way, when you look into your bank account, you're just thinking, oh, I've only got this much money, as opposed to you've already put it away. And you get into that habit of putting things away, and then you spend within your means. That excess money is not there, so that when you go to the shops, and you think, oh, do they have that money to buy that new dress? You're like, oh, I do have money. Look, I've got, I've got a few thousand dollars in the bank. Whereas when you have a, a bit less, you're like, oh, I better not spend that. And then the trouble of like saying, ah, oh, you know, I got to take it out of the investment account. I got to. That's just you're putting these barriers in place so you don't just squander your money. Anyway, I hope that sermon was a blessing for you that you learned a lot. Sorry, I know it was a bit of a long one, but it's a very practical one. I think it's very important as well that Christians are wise with their money because uh, you know a lot of people are not taught these sort of things when they're younger. Even when you watch this sort of stuff on YouTube, they're like, you know, why are they not teaching this stuff in schools? I wish I had learned these things younger, so I had implemented these things in my life younger. It's definitely something I'm trying to implement with my kids, even when we pay them for their chores. I don't know if you've seen like some of the things I've done with my kids. When I pay them for their chores, they don't get to spend all the money that they make. So they may make a dollar, but I, we have different jars that they put that money into, and it's like, hey, 10% of it you're gonna give to God, you know, 20% of it, you're going to invest. And then you can spend like, you know, I can't remember exactly the breakdowns, but something like that. And then you can spend the rest. So they get in the habit of knowing, hey, when I make money, I don't just spend it all. When I make money, hey, I got to put some aside for God. I got to put some aside for investments. And then I have some disposable income that I can use for other things, right? So in conclusion, just remember, making money isn't evil. It's how and why you're making money making money you got to make money wisely so that you increase your productivity and then use it ultimately to serve the lord jesus christ all right let's pray thank you lord for your word um uh, lord this you know i guess you don't really hear a lot of preaching on money from fundamental churches you know it just seems to be a taboo topic but lord we need to be wise about our finances we need to be wise with the money that you've entrusted with us and lord there's just so much in the bible uh, on money and on being a good steward of the resources you've given us so lord not only let us take the spiritual lessons from how we use our spiritual energy but i pray lord that you also help us to be wise with how we use our economic energy as well so that we can be the most productive and and most um, supportive of the things that we do in this earth so lord thank you and we pray these things in jesus name amen